the Gerontological Society of America Momentum Discussions. Welcome to the Momentum Discussion podcast series, where researchers, educators, and practitioners stimulate dialogue on trends with great momentum to advance gerontology. This podcast is one of three in a series about immunization with content developed by GSA and supported by Securus. Welcome to the GSA's 75th anniversary podcast series, Highlighting the Field of Aging. I'm Dr. Cheryl Monturo, Professor of Nursing at Westchester University of Pennsylvania and Nurse Scientist with Chester County Hospital Penn Medicine. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Aaron Shearer, Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Iowa, to discuss risk communication and infectious disease. Welcome, Dr. Shearer. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me on. First, can you tell us what risk communication is and then maybe how you became interested in this? It's an interesting question because it seems like something that is like should be pretty obvious, but may not be to, to most people once you try to explain it. But um, essentially, with risk communication, it's trying to identify you know, potential problems or risk that might be associated with an event or you know, with different types of treatments and really trying to figure out the best way to communicate those risks in a way so that either people can make informed choices or, you know, in some cases where there's a clear benefit, you might want to persuade people towards or against one option. And so my pathway into risk communication was actually completely accidental. Um, <laughs> it began with um, two relatively random events. Um, so uh, when I, so uh, just as a little background, I, I have a PhD in social and personality psychology, which is a little atypical for someone in you know med school. Yeah. Um, but as I was uh, close to finishing my my degree, my PhD work. Angie Bagerlin, who's a world-renowned expert in the development and evaluation of decision aids, as well as risk communication, I mean, gave a talk, and I had the opportunity to meet with her before her talk. And reasons I can't even remember, just before I met with her, I read an article uh, with research demonstrating that using metaphors to describe an increase in crime had a causal impact on what type of criminal justice responses participants preferred. And so essentially what they did is they randomized people to read about crime, spreading crime. And uh, one of the metaphors they used was a prowling beast. You know, another one was a, a virus spreading through the city. And what they found is that for participants who randomized to read about crime as a, as a prowling beast, those participants preferred more kind of retributive or or punitive punishments for, for crime. In contrast, the participants who read about crime as a, a spreading virus, they preferred more uh, debilitative type methods for dealing with crime. And that was completely unrelated to the research I was doing at the time. It just was something that started reading for some reason. So anyway, I had, had this article in, in the back of my mind as I went to meet with Angie, and I hadn't done any work in medical decision-making or risk communication myself, although I had a, an interest in uh, in those areas, but I summarized the article to Angie, and I you know kind of noted the ubiquity of metaphor use in medicine, and I was wondering if you know anyone had done any kind of experiments to show the uh, causal impact of metaphors in medicine, and it turned out that while there had been a lot of observational studies or, or commentaries highlighting the influence of metaphors and their use in, in medicine. Uh, no one had experimentally tested whether they might actually change how people might respond to a health threat. And so we ended up collaborating on a project where we provided the first kind of experimental demonstration of metaphors exerting a causal influence on medical decision making. In, in our studies, we provided some experimental evidence that using metaphors to describe the spread of influenza increased people's willingness to get the seasonal flu vaccine. And so it actually kind of blew my mind that such small changes in language could affect how we think about and respond to, to a health threat and think about risk and benefits. So after I finished my PhD, I ended up being a postdoc with Angie and um, Brian Zygman Fisher, 
another world-renowned risk expert at the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences and Medicine at the University of Michigan. And while I was there, I really got diving head first really in, in into risk communication. So I got involved in a ton of projects right on topics, including you know, pandemic influenza vaccines, how to present clinical lab test results, the bioethics of gold genome sequencing, health insurance policy evaluation, health insurance literacy. So it's all across these areas, there's just tons of examples of areas where we, we do a poor job communicating risk very well. And so th- this experience as a postdoc really solidified my interest in psychology of risk and risk communication. And I've, I've been in, working in those areas ever since. Wow, that, that is a very circuitous way to get there, but that's an amazing story. I'm familiar with Angie Fagerling's work in terms of bioethics. It is amazing. Just changing language can actually change that. Some of your research has focused on outbreak situations such as Zika and obviously COVID. So what have we learned about language and messaging during those outbreaks? And and is there a way to apply what we've learned to everyday older adult immunization messages? Yeah, that's a a good question. Um, And you think that we'd have, you know, a fair amount of research in this area, but there's actually very little that's been done in this area. Most of the research done during outbreaks has been descriptive. So it's usually cross-sectional surveys, trying to find demographic and maybe psychological characteristics associated with disease risk perceptions and preventive behaviors. Or it tends to be like analyses of like how the media talks about vaccines or how it's Vaccines are being discussed on social media. There's very few studies that have tested different risk communication strategies in general, you know, whether there's an outbreak or not, but even less so during active infectious disease outbreaks. And so we really don't have a strong evidence base for how to best communicate about infectious diseases and vaccines uh, in these situations, especially for adult vaccines. Most of the work on vaccine attitudes uh, has been done for childhood vaccines and adolescent vaccines, despite the fact that, you know, around 95%, 95 to 99% of uh, morbidity and mortality from infectious disease, vaccine preventable infectious disease in the U.S. is in adults 50 and older. So there's this weird incongruency there. But the National Academies of Sciences and Engineering and Medicine, last year, they had a discussion with some experts and published scenes of the discussion uh, they can get online that focused on what they thought were strategies to encourage protective behaviors that could be applied, kind of how we think about adult immunization. And so I could go through all 10 of those, but one of the things I wanted to highlight that it seemed to be missed in this that, that's been kind of revealed during the COVID pandemic is that repeated information exposure doesn't mean changes in behavior. So we still have, you know, a substantial number of adults, older adults and younger adults who who haven't gotten vaccinated. And their main concerns are still the safety of the vaccine, the efficacy of the vaccine, despite the fact that we have tons of data to support the safety and efficacy of of the vaccines. In fact, these are the most like these are the best vaccines we've ever developed. And they they're very safe. And yet there's a percentage of population who, who doesn't buy into that message about their safety. And so I think that gets to my second point is that we often fail to address the real issue. For example, you know, as I just noted, a lot of Americans are still concerned about the safety of the vaccines because of how quickly they were developed. And, you know, the typical kind of public health or medical response is that well, you know, these vaccines went through all the same FDA protocols that all other vaccines have gone through. But that doesn't really address the issue, which I think is that, you know, we have an idea that the quicker something's developed and created, the less safe it's going to be. And so but by saying that, you're not really addressing the issue. And so I think, you know, a better strategy would be highlighting how we were able to develop the vaccine so quickly because we had you know, almost 20 years of research on coronaviruses and vaccine development before this happened, 
and we've seen you know unprecedented amount of financial and intellectual res- resources kind of thrown at this, which allowed us to develop them so quickly, which is often, you know, like, I like to use this metaphor, you know, if this were a uh, hundred meter dash, we basically start at the 900 meter mark because most of the work that takes most time is that basic science and that, that bench work. So I think that's um, something similar, you know, thinking about, there's a lot of misinformation that happens with older adults and vaccines. And I think that it's it's critical to really try to recognize that correcting misinformation may not be the best strategy, but, you know, trying to address the underlying issue that's, that's leading to that concern, as well as trying to promote vaccine confidence in general. I think that there's uh, kind of two problems with just trying to correct misinformation. One of them being that we have research showing that when we try to correct misinformation about vaccines, we often are successful. Uh, So, for example, if we tell people that, you know, the flu vaccine doesn't cause the flu, you're going to successfully correct that misperception. But among people who have negative vaccine attitudes, it has this ironic backfire effect where even though you correct the mistaken belief, they actually become less willing to get vaccinated. And so, you know, you, you might fix kind of one problem, but you're not addressing, you know, you make the, the thing you're actually interested in, you know, worse. And then a second problem uh, trying to correct misinformation is that it's kind of like playing a game of whack-a-mole. You know, basically misinformation and conspiracy theories spring up almost immediately during infectious disease outbreaks. And so as soon as you just one piece of misinformation or conspiracy theory, it seems like there's at least one, if not more things that pop up in its place. And so I've been doing a lot of consulting around um, with different groups for, during the COVID pandemic. And one of the things I've been like pushing is rather than focusing on correcting all these, you know, individual pieces of misinformation is really per- trying to focus on strategies of best communicating about vaccine safety and efficacy so that we're, we promote vaccine confidence to these groups rather than trying to just simply negate kind of the, the, the bad information that they have. And I think those are things that can be applied as we think about how to better uh, communicate with older adults about you know, more routine vaccines. Yeah, it seems like it's it's definitely applicable to more than just COVID, but but y- your words are, are really resonating with me in how we seem to turn around and dispel one myth and then another one pops up. So what other research, either yours or others, do you think is important to understand when thinking about vaccine campaigns or messages? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's useful to start out by highlighting, and I alluded to this in my previous answer, that, you know, when medical and public health communication people draft their messages, it's often operating under what some people call an information deficit model of health behavior change, which basically assumes that people don't engage in the, you know, quote unquote, right health behaviors because they don't have, you know, they don't have some piece of critical information or there's some piece of misinformation that they have. And if we could just give them that that information or correct that misperception, you know, that, that would push them towards doing the right thing, like vaccinating. But as I alluded to, uh, you know, you can there's research, and this has been shown in a couple of contexts with vaccines about um, successfully correcting a piece of misinformation, but having this backfire effect on vaccination intentions. I've done some work in on HPV vaccination showing that there are different psychological traits that are associated with whether a young adult has been vaccinated with the HPV vaccine or not. And curiously, we found gender effects where for, for women, it had to do more differences in kind of cognitive traits, such as numeracy, you know, the ability to use and understand numbers and things like that. Whereas with men, it tended to be more associated it had some of the cognitive traits but also had more affective or emotion based traits like responsiveness to threats or need to you know an aversion to uncertainty 
And so I think that that's the thing we really need to understand that, you know, my research has shown and others just has shown is that very rarely is, is the problem going to be a problem of, you know, just getting people the right information. I think that's, it's necessary to get people the right information, but it's not going to be sufficient because oftentimes there's just underlying, there's often an underlying psychological motivation that's, that's driving their resistance to being vaccinated that you need to, to address. That's such an important point, not only in this area, but just in general in patient education with older adults and that assumption that if they have the correct information, they'll be able to provide such care. So that's really important to explain that. So what do you think we still need to better understand about risk communication in older adults? I think anything really we need better understanding of because there's I feel like there's so little research done on risk communication in older adults, uh, with the exception of the decision aid literature, where you know it walks a patient through the potential benefits and potential harms of different treatment options. But you know, I do most of my work in vaccines, but I also think that two areas that would really benefit from additional understanding about risk communication in older adults is around de-prescribing and over-testing or over-diagnosis because it, there's lots of medications and lots of uh, you know, screenings and tests that are done that may be of little benefit to uh, a lot of older adults. But a lot of us have kind of implicit or explicit assumption that, well, if it's been, if it's been approved and it's a test, then surely the benefits outweigh the harms but that isn't always the case. Um, and so I think being able to communicate about, you know, why a patient, you know, why a certain medication might've been useful to a patient earlier, but now may not be a, a, as much of a, of a benefit or may be causing harm if, if it, you know, if they're having side effects or, you know, learning how to explain things like false positive test results and, and mm-hmm. the potential implications of that. You know, there's just a lot of work in that space where uh, you have to kind of override people's kind of really deeply ingrained kind of assumptions about about healthcare, at least in the U.S. Yeah, exactly. That was exactly the thought I had in my mind was we're talking U.S. and and with our audience being international, I wonder how this looks in other countries where they may not have as much of the over testing and the over diagnosing. Yeah, it's, it's funny because I have a collaborator in the UK and I was talking about, I think was how we have, we over test for things like prostate cancer, for example. Uh. And she said, you know, in the UK, they have a problem of getting people screened early enough for, for different cancers to get them treated effectively. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely, you know, the problem definitely manifests potentially in opposite ways in different countries, depending on the nature of the healthcare system and assumptions uh, of the citizenry. So what would you say to new practitioners or researchers who are interested in aging and immunization? I think the practitioners, I think whether they're new or not, you know, I'd really encourage you to make immunization a priority for one reason. If they develop the infection that could have been prevented via the vaccine, a lot of times those vaccine preventable diseases often make underlying conditions worse. So, you know, we've seen with COVID that it, it tends to really, you know, for people with heart conditions, it tends to make those, those conditions even worse. And so I know that, you know, a lot of times practitioners are often, they have limited time with their patients and they're really focused on those chronic type conditions. But I just encourage them to think about vaccination is part of that kind of treatment to, to keep their chronic conditions under control. Um, and also related to that, you know, one of the, the strongest interventions you have to, to increase vaccine uptake is a strong provider recommendation. And so don't underestimate uh, the, the influence that you making a recommendation that they get a vaccine uh, can have on them. For researchers, uh, I would say the world is your oyster. As I said before, you know, even though almost in the U.S. the burden of vaccine preventable diseases is in 
people 50 and older, almost all the research on immunization attitudes, you know, vaccine attitudes and how to change them has been on childhood and adolescent vaccines. And so, for example, we only had a scale to measure vaccine attitudes for adult vaccines. The first one came out in uh, it's either 2017 or 2018. So we've only had a measure of vaccine attitudes that are applicable for adults in the last few years. And so there are just so many areas you can explore in this area. I think one interesting area, you know, I'm actually interested in risk communication directly to patients, but I think another topic that could be of interest are, you know, family members of people who live in you know, long-term care settings, you know, uh, so that they don't bring in, you know, uh, 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 an infectious disease that might affect not just, you know, the people they love, but the people all around them, given um, right. the conditions they're in. And so I think there's, you know, lots of different areas, both in you know, inpatient as well as other settings that you know, they could really explore in terms of aging and, and immunization. Is there one last message that you'd like to leave our listeners with about risk communication? I just encourage you to, when you're listening to a patient in public, really try to identify maybe what might be the underlying motivation that's underlying their resistance and trying to address that. Because as I said, you know, just addressing kind of the surface level information problem is rarely going to have an effect. I think that by trying to get at what's really the root of the problem is going to be is going to be more effective than simply just trying to deal with the, the surface issue. Yeah, that is that is so critical. And I thank you for that and and thank you for sharing such critical knowledge about vaccine health risks to the public. It's particularly valuable as we continue to experience the COVID-19 pandemic the COVID-19 pandemic. And then many thanks to all of you for joining us today. And to learn more about GSA's work on immunization, please visit navp.org or email navp at geron, G-E-R-O-N.org. To learn more about the Gerontological Society of America, visit geron.org. The Gerontological Society of America was founded in 1945 to promote the scientific study of aging, cultivate excellence in interdisciplinary aging research, and education to advance innovations in practice and policy. For more information about GSA, visit geron.org.